Okay, Mike, we're uh, we're gone live as well. And Pinit's joined us joined us as well. Um, Okay, everyone, I think um, we're okay to kick off for you. You guys all happy. Um, we really want to welcome um, Ben Kibler, who I'm quite sure you know has no need for uh, much of an introduction by name. But um, a few things I'd like to say um, about Ben, because Ben has just retired, I think, as of last week. Um, and we could be getting his first um, lecture out of retirement. And when I'd asked him to kindly um, speak um, for our fellows and Northwest Upland Group and, and others who've joined us, um, I was expecting him to talk about something around the scapula or something, you know, that he, he's developed in his career. And he said, oh, you know, can I talk about the new work that we're doing at the university? And um, he may have retired from clinical care, but he's still going with his uh, research and academic work at the university. Um, and he got a very beautiful part of um, uh, the USA. This is known as bluegrass country. And it's uh, the center of, of the horse world, the Kentucky Derby, and a really beautiful uh, part of the world. Um, and he lives in the historic district of uh, Lexington, a very beautiful place to live. Um, when, when you arrive at um, uh, Lexington at the airport, um, you might be lucky enough to get this taxi driver um, who turns up in a 1968 um, Dodge Charger straight out of the Bullet movie. <laughs> and that's the, the, the best way to, to arrive in, in Lexington. Um, uh, ben, really, um, for those who don't know, he used to be, a, a, I think, a semi-professional um, soccer football player. And his son went on to become a professional soccer player. He's always been um, involved in um, sports medicine from very early on. Um, and I've put some of the things that, that, that I feel he's been, and I don't think it's an exhaustive list, um, but I, th I think if you ask him um, which he's most proud of, um, and I've seen this very clearly, um, it's, it's his family. Um, if, if you get him talking about anything, it always ends up going back to, to his family. Um, and I think one of the things um, that I found most amazing that Ben does, which I think a lot of people don't realize, is that he goes on a regular basis, I think it's almost monthly, to a local prison where he um, runs a, a clinic for um, fathers uh, to help build their relationship with their children. And him and his son go together and they, they run this workshop. And the other thing he's most proud of is all the fathers and sons that have um, come out of prison and built their relationships uh, with their children on the back of um, the meetings uh, that he's done in the prison. Um, and that was, he'd done all his years in between all the travel, the research, the surgery. Um, and, and that was very, very impressive to see. Um, I got fortunate enough to, um, to do a road trip in um, speed shop um, where he does his surgery. Um, so <laughs> what, what I'd like to do is the, there's a lovely um, uh, uh, summary of all his achievements if you look online and a lot of them I think will surprise you. 
Um, and, you know, it's a great honor, really, to invite you to be able to speak this here with us. Thank you very much. I'll hand over the screen share to you. Okay. Are you okay to share your screen there? Do you think we've lost him? I think we lost him. Oh, no. Okay. Um, right. Guys, are you all there? I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you should all have screen share. So Ben should have screen share. I think yeah, I'm he's here. dropping off. You know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand the host to one of you guys with a fast connection because I don't know if it's my connection that might be slowing him down. Um, well, Mike, I know you've got a fast connection. Is that okay? I have to say that my kids are currently on Xbox and so my fast connection is being wiped out. Okay. Well, Puneet, you... Puneet? Yeah, 100% happy with that. Okay, just because I know you live in a better broadband area. I wonder if that'll get help. I think we've lost him now. Yeah. He's not He's not on the panel. Uh, I think the internet connection. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the speed issue may be from the Kentucky end. Yeah, it's, it, it's definitely Kentucky end. Uh, your speed issue has nothing to do with it, Lynn. It's the historic district with the historic um, internet. <laughs> I think he got to run outside to put some money in the meter every few minutes. <laughs> so, so, sorry been about that. I'd need to go down to the local prison. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, you see those guys, uh, uh, unbelievable. He is. An unbelievably brave man. I mean, how he finds time to do all that in in between all his busy schedule, it's incredible. Yeah, and and he helped with his own hands. They built a, a church. Um, uh, it was a, a, a derelict building that they restored into a church. Him and his family, because his son his son is a, a pastor. There we go. We've got you back. Yeah, I changed. I changed. I'll see if I can get this any better. Okay, great. Let's go. Let's you go should. here. Let's see what happens. Okay. Okay. Is everybody here? Can everybody see that? Yep. Perfect. All right. Fine. All right. Good. Well, I'm, I apologize, and I guess some of this was uh, I was upstairs. That's usually where it works. But all right. Well, first of all, thank you all very much for. Uh, asking me to talk. Lynn, thank you very much. You are a very good friend and we really did have a good time over here with the, with the car and everything. So it's been a, a great uh, run. I've always enjoyed talking. So uh, Lynn wanted me to talk a little bit about some things about the labrum. And I know this is mainly a baseball thing and I'm a baseball player, but this has to do with glenohumeral stability. And so I'd like to go over a few things, give you some ideas. I'd love to have some some feedback and some comments, see what y'all think about it. Talk a little bit about the functional anatomy and the implications. Remember that the disabled shoulder, the patient who comes to you with a sore shoulder, the reason they are here is because they have lost their concavity compression. They've lost their glenohumeral stability, this dynamic component. And there are a lot of factors we always talk about with bone, ligament, muscle balance, labrum, but uh, labral factors have not really been uh, as well evaluated. So I've, I've been thinking about this and so hopefully this will add, add some interest and some depth to your all's thoughts. We'll talk about the slap lesion and, and I want to only say it to condemn it. Uh, when we look seriously about how a slap injury uh, is treated, uh, there's a lot of imprecision and inconsistency in what is the pathophysiology, in other what does produce the injury, what is the evaluation of the patient who may have a labral injury, and then how do you treat this? I think there's a lot of debate and controversy. We looked at this in two articles, two papers in arthroscopy in 2015, 2016, and we found there's a huge amount of imprecision and inconsistency in how you diagnose it and how you treat it. We thought that maybe that's the reason why you have such variable, disappointing 
outcomes for return to play, return to activity, whatever it happens to be. And you get a lot of what we call failed slap repairs. So let's look at this a little bit. What is, we'll look at the function, we'll look at the dysfunction of the labrum. The labrum, you know, is this thing that fits around the glenoid. It's been said that it's a bumper. It helps to control translation of the, of the uh, humerus. It's an attachment site, obviously, for the biceps and for the ligaments. It deepens the socket. But there's been some debate about, is this really the, uh, an adequate explanation for the functional biomechanical anatomy? So, and is it static or dynamic? So very good work. Dr. Greg Bain from Australia has come up with some very interesting anatomical work looking at the labrum. Turns out the labrum is not the same inferiorly as it is superiorly. Inferiorly, it's the classical bumper. It's convex, it increases the glenoid depth, it acts as a bumper, it produces edge stability so the ball stays in the socket. Just like when you're skiing, when you go downhill, you want to keep that edge in contact with the snow so that you have edge stability so your uh, leg does not slide. It's stiff, it's triangular, well attached to the glenoid, and Greg calls it a fixed organ of compression. And he drew it schematically this way, showing that uh, we have the uh, uh, very thick, well attached inferior labrum. It works with the inferior glenohumeral ligament and with the rotator cuff as a compression to compress the ball into the socket. Very very good uh, system. The superior labrum, however, is more concave. It's rounded. It's more mobile, more deformable. It's almost like a meniscal structure. It follows the glenoid contour to allow this to be a dynamic washer to help conform to the surfaces. It's less firmly attached. And Greg feels, and I agree, that this is a, a mobile organ of tension. It is a tension band. And in this situation, you've got the biceps acting with the labrum in, in tension with the superior and middle glenohumeral ligament to provide this mobile organ of tension to allow a little bit of motion up through there. This is just the construct here, show once again, showing that you've got your rotator cuff and your biceps on the top, the ligaments, and then the fixed organ compression down below. And if you look at the anatomical structure of the labrum, you'll see this is a left shoulder, and you see the long head of the biceps, the fibers run into the posterior labrum, and about at the mid portion, about the nine o'clock position, the, the labrum actually splits. It, one uh, part goes into the glenoid inferiorly, but a large portion of the superior and posterior fibers run into the posterior inferior glenohumeral ligament and form a nice structure all the way around here, providing this nice um, edge stability and compression. So what is there for labral-based dysfunction? Well, that's when the inferior labrum becomes mobile, when it's not the fixed organ compression. You get an extension of mobility from the superior labrum into the posterior labrum. The injury in the situation is a tear, and I'll show you some examples of tear, but actually some flattening, some in-substance injury, some shear and translation. Causation is altered glenohumeral rotation, which allows posterior translation, scapular protraction, and then decreased rotator cuff compression. In addition, labral-based dysfunction is when the superior labrum becomes uh, too mobile. You lose its tension band component, and you lose its ability to compress. The injury, once again, is a tear or it's an attenuation. I'll show you some examples of attenuation of the attachment so it doesn't work very well. Causation, once again, altered glenohumeral rotation. Now, in this situation, you get anterior translation and superior translation with biceps tightness. Biceps pulls on. Biceps can get very tight in this situation as well. So we know, do know, does this happen? Well, we do know that in a tight capsule, we get anterior superior translation with rotation. So there's your tight capsule and, well, your, and you get anterior superior translation. In addition, we know that a uh, tightness will give you an external rotation and abduction. You'll get a posterior and superior translation. So you can get both posterior translation and anterior translation with this tightness of capsule depending on the position of the arm. 
We do know that this has consequences for injury. Internal impingement or the compression of the glenoid uh, against uh, and the humerus uh, with the labrum in between. We do know that upward rotate, decreased upward rotation of the scapula, decreased internal rotation of the scapula, increases area and pressure on the posterior and posterior superior labrum. We also know that this does occur. If you look at injured athletes, you lose external rotation in the injured situation at this critical point of 90 degrees of abduction, and you also lose upward rotation of the scapula. So you get these components of compression, of translation in these normal motions when you have tightness of the uh, capsule, tightness of the muscles, weakness of the muscles, and scapular protraction. So there's a, a lot of things going on here that create this extra pressure and damage the labrum. Okay, the, this, this can be accurately diagnosed that the labrum is involved. This test called the uh, Modified the Dynamic Labral Shear Test. Dr. Sean O'Driscoll from Mayo Clinic talked about it, uh, modified it by standing. Uh, you put the arm in 100 degrees, 110 degrees of abduction, 90 degrees of external rotation, and then you have a, in the plane of the scapula, you move it back into the plane of the body to put some compression on it, and then you downward motion, you shear. What you're doing is you're just pinching that internal impingement between the two bones. It'll create the symptoms and it'll give you pain along the posterior joint line. It's a very good test. The statistics are very, very good. Uh, it's a level one um, uh, paper that we wrote in AJSM in 2009. What this shows is that labral increased labral mobility, loss of edge stability and internal impingement. So the hallmarks of the anatomic lesion. There's a very high probability, therefore, that there's a labral tear present on the posterior labrum. Now, it's not necessarily the only indication because you have to have other factors, but that's a very good, helpful surgical ind indication. Here are the statistics from that paper, and you can see that anything above 0.75 is, con is considered to be clinically significant. Well, you see that all of these factors, specificity, accuracy, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, likelihood ratio, are all much higher in the DLS than the other tests. So it's a good test that you can use in your clinical evaluation. This is how it's done. Once again, you, 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 the point of tenderness is right back where you put your scope posteriorly and you bring it right there. You bring it down and it hurts as you bring it into that abduction external rotated position. You can stabilize the scapula in retraction and that will relieve the symptoms because you've gotten the glenoid out of the way. Doesn't mean you don't have an injury, but it just means that the scapula is, scapular protraction is part of the problem. Now, I think you can say that the slap is not the major problem in overhead throwing athletes and overhead workers. The slap, the superior labrum, anterior posterior is not the problem um, because uh, you still may have an intact rotator cuff, scapula. You know, you have to have an intact posterior labrum and posterior band you have to have uh, in, intact compression, uh, that's the problem. If you don't have that, then it's where you get into the labral symptoms. What we have worked here uh, at, with the Shoulder and Elbow, American Shoulder and Elbow Society task group is to come up with a better understanding of the labral injury. And so we don't use SLAP anymore. We call it a clinically significant labral injury or CISLI, you know, for a better word. And I think it better describes, and I'll show you why, if there's an anatomic labral injury that may be anterior or posterior or inferior, that has to be associated with the correct clinical symptoms. There are several different types. You may have the original, the original slap where you have a, a increasing biceps tension. You may get it that way. That's where Andrews and Snyder first described this. You may have an extension of the superior injury into the posterior, the so-called slap eight, and that's actually fairly common or you get a direct posterior shear with an injury in the posterior labrum itself. And this has to do with the superior and inferior labral uh, uh, anatomy. Now, these are some hand drawings here. I apologize for this. But basically, this upper portion right here shows that you have the glenoid, the biceps, and attaching here, so that's your mobile organ of tension, your tension band. Then you have the fixed organ of compression with the bumper, and the inferior glenoid humeral ligament. If you look at it from the side, you've got uh, the, su the superior part is running from about 1030 on around to about 130. This upper part is the 
uh, and, is, and you got an anchor point posteriorly and anteriorly for this mobile organ of tension. Then you have a very well firmly affixed uh, compression all the way around the, from the 1030 all the way around about the three o'clock position with the anterior and posterior inferior glenohumeral ligaments acting as a compression. So there's your nice circle where the ball will sit and, it's, uh, and it has the organ of compression around it. This creates and facilitates this joint concavity compression. So you can have a stable slap. What I mean by that is that you may have a little bit of injury up at the biceps origin, but if the anterior and posterior anchors of the mobile organ of tension are intact, then you don't have any symptoms because you don't have any real pathology <clears throat> to work on. This is where you get these positive MRIs and when there's really not a problem. There's a little bit of a defect there, but it's not associated with the instability. There's minimal loss of tension band, there's no loss of the bumper, and therefore this is your baseball pitcher who can throw and you get an MRI and it shows some uh, superior labral detachment. You don't, that's not the reason why they have symptoms. That's relatively rare, but it, it does, uh, you do need to realize that. However, there can be superior labral tears. These could be uh, tears or in substance where you lose the tension band. And therefore you get some anterior superior humeral head translation uh, with the increased tension on the front of the shoulder. And if you're gonna get symptoms there, they're gonna be anterior and they're gonna be out at ball release or throwing motion or overhead working out in front. And then sometimes there'll be this anterior shoulder pain right here on the front. It may be some biceps, maybe a little anterior impingement, but the pain is usually anterior as you come in this motion in forward. The exam will show the anterior tenderness. You can have some biceps tension. And the best way to do biceps tension test is to just take the arm straight out this way, pronate the arm, put tension on it, and then bring your arm into horizontal abduction. And you'll have pain that runs right along the biceps. It's a very good test for bi increased biceps tension. And most of these uh, patients will have that. <clears throat> you may have an O'Brien's test that's positive because once again, that's more of the biceps tension component, but you don't have a lot of posterior labral findings. They don't hurt in abduction extra rotation and the DLS is usually not positive. Sometimes it will be a little bit. So this is what it looks like. So you get a superior labral injury where the anchor points usually posteriorly are disrupted or you lose, you get attenuation of all this structure from about 10 o'clock about to uh, 12 o'clock, and you'll see a peel back when you look at it arthroscopically. Here's some examples. This is what you see on MRI. You can see uh, that you'll see this flattening. I don't know if everybody can see this. There's a flattening of the uh, edge, right? This is, just, this is just this shear. This is just this constant pressure going back and forth, flattening, not detaching, but flattening, and therefore decreasing the ability of the labrum to do its job. This is what it looks like on a right shoulder. You can see that uh, there's a peel back. So there's the internally rotated, there's externally rotated. You see how the labrum just kind of peels right off from about 10 o'clock up to 12 o'clock. And the redness here indicates the, the damage. You just peels off right there. You can actually find little splits in the tissue right there. And you lose this bumper because this whole thing just kind of falls off. You can fix this surgically. You clean it up and put a couple of anchors at about the 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock position and you get rid of the symptoms. You, you see, here's another case where you have a nice bumper, but you put them in extra rotation and the labrum just peels right off the backside. This whole thing is deficient. And therefore you can imagine humeral head's not gonna work very well and the biceps are gonna work very well uh, with this instability. You actually sometimes have to kind of mobilize it as so, and then you just, once again, repair it, and that gets your whole uh, tension band back very nicely here, and it gets your bumper very nicely here. There's a couple of anchors. So that's relatively rare in my uh, cases. I uh, have the second type is this, the cold, cold uh, slap, slap eight, where you have an extension of your superior labral injury all the way around into the posterior aspect and it can run all the way down. And then it can actually run into the posterior band. So it's along this whole back edge. 
you lose your tension band, you lose your bumper, you lose your edge stability, and then you lose your your posterior inferior glenohumeral humeral ligament tension. So you really have nothing on the backside. These patients are quite symptomatic when they get their arm into any type of abduction, extra rotation, or any posterior compression. This is what it looks like uh, on the exam, right shoulder. Once again, the superior labrum is damaged. You got this tear running all the way around the backside from 12 o'clock all the way down to eight o'clock. It extends, you see, it actually extends into the posterior band. It does not go around to six o'clock. It goes in the substance of the uh, uh, labor and into the posterior band. When you clean it all off, it's a very, very large lesion all the way around here. This requires a lot of, lot of treatment. So once again, looking at it from the front, you can re, you can reconstitute the bumper, and you can see when well, you get the band, you get the tension in the posterior band. So you have taken care of that problem as well. So you have tension all the way around from the uh, twelve o'clock all the way down. So there's your 12 o'clock position and you see your sutures go all the way down and around the posterior labrum and into the posterior band. Now you have corrected all of the pathological anatomy that exists and, and gives you the symptoms. Here's another case once again with this large lesion running all the way down into the posterior band with in substance splitting of the tissue as well as the detachment away from the bone. So this, you've got several things that, that you have to repair at the same time. Here's a case that's right up here, right close to 12 o'clock. And it comes down here. And this is actually a splitting where there's actually a ripping of the fibers. So you kind of peel the outer edge off of the inner edge of the labrum. And it goes once again, all the way down to the back to the inferior part. You can clean all this off very nicely. And then you repair it again. You'd have to, you know, but this is a very large lesion. You, the third type is just a strictly posterior translation, where there's a shear of the humeral head on the glenoid. There's a tear away from the glenoid, but this is where you get a lot of these in-substance delamination lesions. Uh, you do not debride those. That, that, that's, a, that's a part of the labrum that is necessary to provide the bumper again. So this is what you see on MRI, the classical um, axial uh, view shows uh, perhaps a lesion. We do what's called an axial oblique, which takes it at right angles. And you see this is exactly the same patient. See how well this shows this delamination, this detachment, this nasty problem. This is all in posterior. This is about at eight o'clock. Here's another MRI showing once again this tear and then this delamination. And this is the arthroscopic picture of this patient showing this big tear and this delamination of the tissue away from the bone. This would be from like nine o'clock down to about seven o'clock. Here you get a tear away from the glenoid. You get a flattening of the surfaces. You get fraying and in substance degeneration. You see there's a, this peeling off of this cover that goes across the entire top of the, of the labrum. This whole thing is damaged, not just this part, but see the in substance tearing and then the, then the delamination right here. And once again, you lose the posterior band. There's no tension in the posterior band. You see this whole thing's just been pushed off of the edge of the bone. And this can go, like I said, into the substance of the labrum and down along the posterior band. This is why the posterior band is bad. See, there's that injury that runs all the way from the uh, 10 o'clock position all the way down to the 6.30 or 7 o'clock position. This is what we call the orange peel lesion. You see this, once again, you see where this, this covering, this outside wrap has just been peeled off of the labrum and you get these longitudinal splits in the tissue and this whole thing is damaged. So you, have to, you don't debride this because if you do, you take half of the thickness of the labrum away. You can pull this back over and reattach it back to the bone very nicely. You just looking at it from the front, you just take your stitch, you pull all that tissue back together. So you've gotten that, that back covering all the way back over the top. You've closed the delamination and you've reattached it back to the bone. Now you have your bumper and now you have your posterior band. So now you've created once again, the more normal anatomy. So in conclusions, this Sicily lesion 
Uh, the posterior labrum is a key component. Uh, it addresses palatohumeral stability and concavity compression. You need to have the biceps uh, anchor as a tension band. You need the posterior bumper. You need to have an intact posterior glenohumeral ligament attachment, recreating the edge stability. If those are the, would be the goals of the surgical procedure. I don't think you can get out of the shoulder until you've done all that. The injury is damage to the labral anatomy, either detachment from the glenoid, in substance, delamination or flaps, that most of the time will go into the posterior inferior glenohumeral ligament, and therefore you lose your tension band, you lose your bumper and edge stability, and there's, you get this increased humeral head translation. The location may be variable depending on, I guess, the way that the forces are applied to the shoulder, but you need to look at all those areas. And of course, they can go around anteriorly as well. Uh, you've got to have a really good arthroscopic evaluation. Too often, people look at the superior labrum and fail to see the posterior and posterior inferior labrum and therefore treat the wrong thing and maybe create more problems. Now, you treat you don't over or under treat. You got to respect the biceps as an organ of tension. A 12 o'clock anchor anterior and posterior will eliminate the biceps as an organ of tension and create stiffness in the shoulder, over constraining the shoulder and biceps pathology. Uh, and making you taking that from a mobile organ of tension into a fixed organ of compression that doesn't work up there at the top and understand the organ of compression, how you have to maintain the bumper. You gotta maintain its capability of working as an attachment site for the posterior band. So that the dynamic, the disabled throwing shoulder is a loss of dynamic stability. The treatment is restore the stability, restore the anatomy the way it should be, evaluate the posterior labral integrity, restore the organ of compression, don't damage the organ of tension, Here's a good example of that. This is a quote unquote failed labral repair. It has one 12 o'clock stitch. You can see all the red inflammation around there. So that, that I fixed my slap. Well, he missed everything from 10 o'clock all the way around the corner, all the way down through here. This, this is what is the real problem. You need to fix that. I had to take this out. Did not do a bicep steam diesel because the biceps actually is pretty good, but we fixed everything down through here. It's interesting that if you have a patient who has had labral surgery and he has continued or worsening symptoms, we did a survey of 27 uh, patients who had these failed labral repairs. 21 of the 27, the pathology was found to be unrecognized and untreated posterior labral injury uh, in conjunction sometimes with anterior labral injury, uh, that it was still present. Of that group, in the revision in the revision surgery group, we got 76 of them, 76 percent of them, to return to play or uh, activity um, by fixing the posterior component uh, and not doing a biceps tenodesis. So that's uh, kind of an update on current thought, current practice on this. Be very interested to hear y'all's comments and um, and questions. Brilliant. Th thank you very much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. So, um, everyone, um, if you could just um, put any questions either in the Q&A or um, the chat box and uh, or otherwise um, raise your hand and we'll be able to see you and you can ask any questions. Um, Ben, thank you. Thank you very much. It's very interesting and uh, an insight into the labrum. I've got a couple of questions, really. And, um, you know, there's originally, previously, the, there was a lot of slap repairs done. And there's a paper just been published in AJSM, uh, I saw it today, on biceps tenodesis um, in athletes. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, there's been a big move away from slap repairs towards biceps tenodesis in the U.S. Uh, we lost you there, Len. I don't know if that was me or if that's yours. 
that was me. I was just asking, how does that all fit with um, what's um, what you've just presented in terms okay. of you know this move towards biceps tenodesis? Yes, I think there are a couple of points here that need to be made uh, about that. I think the main reason is that the, as I said, the theory and practice that was governed by the thinking that this was a slap lesion is found to be wrong. It is not, it is not the reason why you have the problem of the, of the shoulder pain. Um, I think it, it's shown, like I said, through all these papers that show that the traditional 12 o'clock anchors uh, uh, does not work uh, for uh, treatment. And the reason they do that is because that was the wrong dogma. Now, a lot of the uh, process of biceps tenodesis came about because when you did a failed slap repair, you saw this biceps was damaged. So they did the biceps release and the patients got better. A lot of those were iatrogenic. We created those biceps lesions by putting that 12 o'clock anchor and stitch in there. And so that's one reason. The second, as I mentioned, we're finding now that, especially in overhead athletes, the biceps itself can be tight. It can be tight for a lot of different reasons, scapular protraction, e eccentric muscle activity, lots of reasons. And so it'll give you some anterior pain. So if you do a biceps tenodesis, you decrease the tension on the biceps, and therefore it does take care of some of this pain. However, in the throwing athlete, the high demand overhead athlete, you need that organ of tension, um, this tension band, to maximize, optimize your concavity compression. So far, there's been very little evidence that uh, overhead athletes who have the biceps tendesis get their same function back in terms of ball velocity, you know, however you want to put it, strength, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think the problem is that incomplete understanding of the biomechanics has led to this problem and indeed this we can get the biceps in, in our throwing program you met mike Hell, he's really good we can get this biceps loosened up and they don't need this they don't need the biceps tenodesis you can actually increase the, the 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 stretching capability of the biceps pretty easily and you get the that plus your rotation and that takes care of the large majority of the ones who have this anterior pain now some of them will have that labral lesion but once again you fix the labral lesion you don't the, the biceps is not the reason why you hurt when you get your arm back in here and why you click and catch. That does, that's not the bi biceps hurts out here. So the ones who hurt with their arm back in through here, they don't, they need their biceps. There's a paper, speaking of papers, just appeared this month's issue of the yellow J-A-A-O-S. The lead author is Sheehan, but, um, uh, Jim Bradley from Pittsburgh and John Conway from Texas and myself were the main authors of this paper. It, go, it goes over most of these things I just brought up, and it makes a very strong case for looking at this from a different perspective. Uh, so I think, indeed, there are some times when biceps is necessary to be taken care of, but I think if you understand where the biceps is supposed to work, then you don't take it just for the heck of it. So uh, that's fantastic. So the the return to sports after slap repairs for overhead athletes, um, you know, initial studies were great, and then the reality came out, and the return to sport was very poor, less than thirty percent. Um, now there's this move towards biceps tenodesis. What's the return to sport for throwing athletes with biceps tenodesis looking like? Well, right now there's a very mixed bag. As, as of last time we had an in-person live meeting when I talked to these people back when, uh, you know, it's, it's less than half of those. And it's interesting that they get rid of their pain, but they don't have the other performance activities, ball velocity, ball location. They don't get that back either. And the reason for that is you, you still don't have the precise ball and socket kinematics that you need to have this, you know, this capability of doing this very, very rapidly. But I'll, I'll just... For workers, they can't work with uh, endurance if they don't have a stable ball and socket. And so a biceps tenodesis in that group does not work either. Um, the attendee, um, up to what age is the organ philosophy applicable as we see lots of damage 
So, sorry, you might have lost me. Up to what age is the organ philosophy applicable as we see lots of damage and degeneration in the older labrum? Yes. All right, now, so you have this injury, but the other side of this is what is the demand? What is your 55-year-old person doing with his shoulder that needs this precise ball and socket kinematics? In that situation, uh, you do a lot of times we'll see a biceps that's damaged. You see a biceps, that, and in that situation, you do biceps tenodesis, and you can you can manage that 10 to 15 percent loss of precise ball and socket kinematics by having a good rotator cuff or good you know repaired rotator cuff. So, and the other thing is, very few 55 year old guys are doing this all the time. They just they just aren't. And therefore, the damage they get is from degenerative change and rotator cuff, degenerative change, and they're not putting the same demand or load. It's not that they don't have it. I will, if the patient, I, I don't have an age limit. If they have a positive DLS and they have to do activities that are overhead and they have pain in this position, I will address their labrum as part of the pathology as well. If they don't, if you negative DLS and they have some, uh, you know, some problems with rotator cuff, then I will treat the rotator cuff. I'll maybe debride the labrum. So I don't think there's a cutoff point. Usually you're gonna say, you know, 35 or 40, but that's with the old, remember that, that was with the old way of treating of that 12 o'clock anchor. You gotta get away from the idea that, that the 12 o'clock anchor is the way to treat these. And uh, so uh, it, it's more functional, it's more, do they hurt when they get up here? Do they have difficulty doing it? Do they have a positive DLS? Do they have weakness in this position? Do they have biceps tightness? Those are the things, not an MRI, not even a scope, uh, will tell you what a good, as John Kelly from Philadelphia calls, a man scan, do the exam. And then you have a better understanding of who, who actually has a functional problem. If you have a functional problem, you gotta address it. If you don't have a functional problem, you don't have to address it. Mm -hmm. Uh, th thank you. I mean, uh, it, a, a more practical um, uh, question as well is um, with these overhead athletes, so say the, the younger group as well, but then as you say, and, and I know you, you set up the Medical Society for um, Tennis in Kentucky, so you'll be seeing a lot of um, tennis players that, that, that are you know, in the 40s, mm -hmm. 50s, 60s. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what would be the indications for you that this person would um, go for surgery? Are there any specific clinical indicators like the DLS and any radiological or injection indicators? Yes, the patient obviously has to have pain in the position where he's going to put load on the structures. That's going to be up through here. You know, down here with his arm down side, the, very rarely you're going to have labral injuries. It has to be up here, either in cocking or activities back in abduction and rotation, at ball release or straight overhead, or in forward flexion or follow through. If they have pain up through here, then the labrum is playing a role. The other thing is you have to have a location. You have to have pain along the joint line, either anteriorly or posteriorly. It has to hurt in these motions through here. There's a good test in addition to the DLS. Dr. Bradley, is called, he calls it the D-pit, where you have them forward flex their arm and you stop them from going forward. Put a, and that puts tension on there. So I, those, those two tests are dynamic tests. This tests the posterior labrum, this tests the anterior tension band. So you just have the arm here and you just stop them as they come forward. Those are two very good dynamic functional tests to say that the labrum is uh, part of the problem. So imaging, Remember, imaging only confirms what you find. It's a static two-dimensional picture. It's not a three-dimensional picture. It only confirms, hopefully, what you have discovered from your history and your physical exam. You've had a failure of physical therapy, good therapy, where you have scapular control, where you have humeral head co-contractions so that you're actually keeping the ball right in the socket and optimizing rotator cuff capability to work with that uh, organ of compression and biceps eccentric stretching so that you're uh, so you're optimizing the ability to uh, uh, for the biceps to work those things if if you have done all those and they failed then an arthroscopic evaluation is worthwhile then if you see this labrum of some kind and then you know that it's part of the problem if 
some of these tests are negative and everything, and the labor looks bad, trim it up, let it go, don't fix it. And do you feel in the clinical tests that um, the role of the scapular repositioning would affect influence whether you're going to go more of a surgical route or more of a rehab route. You showed it very nicely with the DLS. Yes, uh, we did a paper on this in 2009 where we looked at two groups of patients, um, but all of them had the clinical indications for labral injury. They had the, all the pain I talked about, they had imaging that was positive. Uh, half, we put them all on a rehabilitation program of scapular control, optimizing glenar humor rotation, rotator cuff strength. We found that after five weeks, more than half of them, 54%, reduced their symptoms. The other 46% did not. We followed them for a year. We found that if you got better in five weeks, those are like 26 of them. Only one of them subsequently requested surgery for labral pathology. Of the 24 that did not get better, 20 of them ultimately requested surgery. So, so therapy is very helpful in 40 to 60% of the patients, and you will know by about five weeks which groups the patients fall into, but very definitely. And then if you do that scapular repositioning there in the exam and you find that they change the symptoms, then very definitely that tells you that therapy is going to be needed either before surgery or in place of surgery. It's certainly going to need to be after surgery as well to maintain that position. Thanks, that's really helpful. Um, we've got a question um, from uh, Catherine Woodall. Um, as a physio, I often find no pain in abduction and lateral rotation. But when you contract the biceps in that position, that reproduces the symptoms. Sure. Uh, um, is that a pull on the biceps, on the labrum? Um, and she says exactly all right. failed rehab, but improved with a, a slap repair. Exactly right. See, once again, you get in there, and there, then the biceps contracts, and you're gonna, if it's unstable, it's, it's actually gonna pull that labrum <laughs> more. That's like, I'm pretty sure that's what happens with these tight biceps. They contract and they actually pull. That's probably how that slap uh, goes into a slap eight, is it tight biceps? Um, because yeah. it'll eventually pull and pull and pull. And once again, we do that, we do this biceps eccentric test and get them back here and they'll be tight. We do these exercises, loosen up, and we find that a large majority of those will not need surgery. However, if you find that and you can't get it better, you fix them, then you work on this and they do get better uh, once you uh, address the biceps as well. So I think that's why it's very important to say, what is the criteria for a failed repair? It's either misdiagnosis, wrong surgery, or wrong rehabilitation. Yes. Yeah. The um, thank you. That, uh, that's absolutely right. And I just want to add for, for Catherine, um, before Catherine goes and writes it up, um, it was described, I originally saw exactly what you described, Catherine, as the AERS test or the ARS test. Um, and I saw that from <laughs> Lauren Lafosse about uh, 15 years ago. Um, I think uh, there is another question from the audience. Uh, it doesn't say who's asked the question. Anonymous attendee, how would you measure biceps tightness slash length? I don't worry about length. I worry about tightness. And once again, it's a functional test. Um, first of all, they may have pain in the biceps groove. Sometimes they will have a protracted scapula with pain if you pull the scapula back, then that tension goes away, so the pain will be less. Our main test is, like I said, you take down to 90 degrees of abduction, 90 degrees of external rotation, you have them extend the elbow, then pronate, that puts the biceps on the most tension, most stretch, and then you just have it come back this way into hyperextension, and they will, they will describe this pain that runs right along the, the biceps right there. You may also get them into this position, what we call the, the power position, where you get the arm here and you bring your arm back in this position, which is how you throw, and they will describe tightness through there. So either all the way out this way or with elbow flex this way, they will be tight in this area 
uh, through there. That's our main uh, two clinical tests that we look for. Um, may I ask you a question? This is again a clinical question. If you had the patient uh, who's had a previous slap repair and all things being equal, uh, you know, the rehab has been good and then the patient's quite appropriately selected, but unfortunately they've had a failed slap repair, uh, what would be your thought process in choosing the next surgery? Okay, very good. First of all, I would I would say, okay, you've had your surgery. What was your diagnosis that you were told at that time? Oh, slap or whatever, impingement, whatever. And I said, do you know what was done in the operation? I try to get as many of the operative reports as I can, because that'll give me an idea about where they put the anchors, what they did, how they cleaned things up. Sometimes that's available. That's very helpful. If they did a slap repair and put the 12 o'clock anchor, then I'm, I'm pretty well know what I'm going to find is going to be some of the problems. Also, did they go anterior posterior? So a lot has to do with with what they what they did before. If they don't know, then we'll have to find. I uh, ask about the rehabilitation. Did you only do modalities and rotator cuff exercises? Did you do scapular control? Did you have core stability? Did you address range of motion and rotation? Did you address biceps? All those things need to be addressed to make sure that you had a, a an adequate um, physiological restoration. If that's all negative, you also really look hard at the biceps. You do all the tests for the biceps, pain to palpation, biceps groove soreness, biceps tension tightness, injections to see if they got if they get any relief. Everything you do to make me know dynamically what the biceps is capable of doing, both good and bad, because that's going to be a very important thing when I get in there arth arthroscopically to know how the biceps is working. If the biceps does not hurt, is not tight and it looks pretty good on, on scope, then there's no reason to do anything to the biceps. You deal with the other problem. Like I said, in the study that I did, three-fourths of the patients had not had the labral pathology addressed adequately. They overdid the 12 o'clock and underdid the 10 o'clock to 7 o'clock. And you'll usually find a lot of uh, damage in through there, a lot of splitting. You'll see this humeral head kind of coming out the backside with this labrum just basically flattened it just it instead of being sitting on top like it, it's flat it's kind of rolled off of the of the glenoid so you need to do that i will do a biceps tenodesis if they have bicep pathology on exam or on actually inspection at the time whether it's in substance injury um instability at the outlet um you know longitudinal uh, damage. Uh, I will almost always, if they have a DLS that's positive, I will almost always do some type of repair to the labrum as well, because the labrum is telling, uh, the, the DLS is telling me and the deep hit test is telling me that the ball is not stable in the socket. And so you want to try to do as much as you can to recreate that organ of compression, recreate the bumper, make sure that bicep, the, the inferior band of the glenohumeral ligament has tension back in it because that's that that hole from the posterior band through the posterior labrum to the biceps the biceps as a tension band that whole thing holds the shoulder together and so you need to address that so that'll be my first i'll look in the front uh, sometimes if they got impingement we will need to look at the subacromial space so you almost have to do that but there's a lot of information that you can get beforehand that'll guide you when you do the surgery but at the time of surgery you got to fix you got to unfix what's not right. You got to take that stitch out. You try to save the biceps if you can. Get rid of all the the twelve o'clock sutures and all the synovitis, and then um, work. The other thing is, if they had the surgery and and they got a tightness of the shoulder, that that's an overconstrained biceps almost by definition. So you know you need to do something with that. If they have a history of yeah, I had the surgery and I, it took me eight months before I could get my arm in abduction extra rotation. You know that that biceps was overconstrained at the time of surgery. That's brilliant, thank you. Uh, ben, that was a sensational talk. Um, certainly it meets with a lot of our findings that many of our undiagnosed shoulder pains in, in athletes, the, the source of the problem is the posterior labrum. And yes. it was just, just your thoughts really, because throughout my entire training, when, when I was learning about shoulder and sport and arthroscopy, we had slap lessons, we had anterior instability lessons, 
and then the posterior labrum and posterior translation was all gumped together with atraumatic instability um, and voluntary subluxation and dislocation, right. and, and therefore was put in a box which said, don't operate on this because they're crazy. <laughs> and so right. I think the more we understand about the posterior labrum as, as an entity, you know, um, we, when we wrote our study, you know, in rugby players, 40% of all labral surgery yes. was posteriorly. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's fantastic. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is when we're doing slap tears, what, the common thing that I've seen in, in failed ones is when they've been repaired, they've, the surgeons caught the superior capsule. And mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. deep, that, that valley between the superior labrum and the underside of the cuff is often uh, repair, uh, repaired as part of the repair. And that really does lead to a very s stiffness yes. within that um, area. Exactly right. And the other component of this, if you use those high strength, those um, you know, really, really tight, thick, uh, high strength sutures at the uh, 10 o'clock position, 11 o'clock position, they're perfectly appropriate for the organ of compression, but they're too tight, too stiff, too damaging uh, on the superior part. And one of the things we always were told about, if you leave this Stitches proud, you're going to get that humeral head erosion. Well, you saw that an awful lot. Well, the reason for that, my own understanding, is that you had those high strength, very abrasive sutures. And because you made that into an organ of compression, you compress the humeral head up against that really tight uh, suture. And that's why these, these lesions occurred. I never used high strength. I always stayed away from that. And I don't have, in, in my cases I don't have that humeral head erosion because I didn't make it too tight and I didn't use those high strength uh, sutures up there at the top so I think those are all and nowadays we use the knotless and all that kind of stuff get rid of the ink get rid of the suture but I have seen a knotless suture at the 1230 position create a large humeral head lesion because it made everything too tight so even a knotless it's not the knot itself it's the suture and the compression that created this lesion That's great. Thank you. We've got last question from the attendees is how much time uh, does a slap need to heal after surgery or non-operative? Well, um, once again, I'm trying to say that the slap, I don't, I don't worry about the slap. <laughs> okay. So, but a labral lesion, yeah, like I say, after about five weeks, we know if we're going to have any um, uh, capability of restoring the functional capability. So after that five weeks, then we will put them on a, you know, they're on the disabled list for throwing. It'll be a couple of months at least. For surgical procedures, you fix them, you know, they can't throw. They, we don't let them even throw it for four months. They don't get their fastball for six months. It takes for tennis players, it's about six months. Position players in baseball, about six months. Uh, pitchers, even longer. Thank you very much. Um, ben, look, thank you so much. Um, the the meter's running out. Um, we just want to say thank you so much from you know my colleagues um, at the Wright International Unit and myself. I think this is the largest panel we've had. We've got pretty much um, most of our upper limb surgeons here to listen to you today. And we've had one of the biggest um, audiences to Thursday um, after evening lecture, particularly when it's a, such a beautiful sunny day outside. <laughs> um, so we, we can't thank you um, enough for this. And, uh, you know, I think from all of us, we wish you the very best um, with your next chapter. And um, we look forward to hearing about your next chapter. Thank you very much. Well, as usual, you know, Lynn, you as a person, Wrightington as an institution, and United Kingdom as a place, you all are, you all are some of my favorites. <laughs> so I'm always glad, love to talk with you all, love to be with you all. And so thank you for asking me to talk and share. And hopefully we'll do this again. And when the travel gets better, I'm, I'm coming over again. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you all very much. We have to tell everyone, your your family are Bolton Wanderers. <laughs> well, yes, yes. There's. I think they're 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 going to have to make some comebacks. They're they're not doing too well. 
everyone's allowed to make one mistake in life, Ben. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Thank all. you Bye -bye. everybody, for coming and joining us. Um, it will be live if you want to watch it again on YouTube. Thank you very much.